Welcome to the School of Batman, a podcast where we ask academics to help Batman fight crime using their research. I'm your host, Chris George, amateur scientist and professional Batman enthusiast. In today's episode, we'll be discussing the case of the toxic reservoir. We're pleased to be joined by Lewis McKenzie, who has a PhD in biomedical optics at the University of Glasgow and is currently in a postdoc position at the University of Leeds. Lewis, we'd like to start the podcast with a bit of background on yourself. So how did you come to biomedical optics? What exactly is biomedical optics? And what was your journey? So what is biomedical optics? That's a really big question. Uh, but in basic terms, I would say that it's biomedical optics combines uh, the physics of light and how light interacts with matter, especially biological matter, and then trying to get uh, that light to give us useful information about biological systems. So that's the, the bio and optics. And the medical part is trying to harness that information in order to give some sort of useful uh, medical information that would be useful uh, to people, uh, not just to specific researchers in biology. My inspiration uh, for studying science uh, from when I was a kid was I had a huge fascination for space, anything astronomy related. I love space, still do. And uh, I studied physics and astronomy at undergraduate level. And I, I have to admit that I didn't actually study uh, biosciences at a university level or even a advanced uh, secondary or high school level. Uh, I did the bare minimum of biology at first uh, because I was so focused on astronomy and space. Uh, and p during my undergraduate degree, I realized what I really liked doing was working out in a lab tinkering with things in the lab, building instruments, building devices, that was really fun. And uh, unfortunately, astronomy doesn't necessarily have a huge amount of opportunities in that direction. And I was really fortunate at the University of Glasgow that a new research group had rolled into town in the physics department there. And uh, they were looking for people to do PhDs in biomedical imaging, uh, especially imaging of blood vessels in the eye and in other parts of the body. And there was a sort of light bulb moment for me that I'd never considered biomedical optics before that, but actually there was a huge amount of crossover. And um, so it was, it was a sort of light bulb moment, but, uh, and it seems quite unusual, but there's actually quite a lot of crossover between things like astronomy and biomedical optics. And they're not obvious, but I can explain them. Uh, so astronomy is all about gathering light uh, from a subject that you can't touch, you can't measure, you you know, stars, planets, you, you just can't measure them in any way apart from with the light that they emit. And of course, very recently, we've had the discovery of gravitational waves, but I'll stick to light. So in astronomy, you look at uh, the spectrum of light emitted by stars, for example. You might look at how that spectrum of light changes with different elements, different compositions, or uh, due to motion of a target. And in biomedical optics, you can do similar things. So my PhD was all about measuring blood oxygen level, and that was measuring about how light was uh, absorbed by blood. Uh, and for example, you can measure blood flow rate uh, by looking at how the spectrum is uh, changed slightly by the, by the movement. So you've got some techniques that are similar in astronomy as they are to biomedical optics. And in biomedical imaging, uh, generally speaking, you want to be as what's called non-invasive as possible. You want to do your imaging without affecting your target in any way. And in a lot of ways, astronomy is the ultimate non-invasive subject because your targets are stars that are several light years away or galaxies uh, that are even further away than that. Um, so it was a bit of a strange move from astronomy to biomedical imaging, but it was a really nice one. And a lot of the skills that I learned in astronomy can be used for biomedical imaging as well. Is biomedical imaging the umbrella term for the area of research and biomedical optics is a subset of that or are those terms interchangeable? Yeah, biomedical imaging, I suppose, would uh, uh, encompass a larger area because uh, you can image the body in many different ways. Uh, 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 for example, you can do conventional optical imaging, uh, you can do ultrasound imaging, which is a different uh, modality that's using sound. Uh, you can do imaging uh, with uh, 
radiation, for example, and that's another thing entirely as well. Uh, so yes, biomedical optics, I would say, is a subset of biomedical imaging in general. So is, is the field of biomedical optics that you're working in quite an advanced kind of forward thinking era of it? Because some of those things that you were talking about there are, are quite old technologies that have been around for a while. Um, but obviously things change as technology moves on and is the work you're doing something that couldn't have been done 20 years ago, for example? So the pace of innovation in biomedical optics is a, and biomedical image in general is a, a really rapid pace. Things are constantly improving. Uh, the images are always getting better in, in every type of technique you'll use. Um, the particular technique that I work on uh, as a postdoc with the blood test, that involves cutting edge nanotechnology as well as cutting edge biochemistry, uh, as well as the optic side of it. And that could, uh, well, the biochemistry there has been developed in the past five, 10 years. So it is really cutting edge research. And has the rate of change been increasing in, in the last kind of say 10, 15, 20 years, or has it been fairly consistent since, since the area of studies inception? Yeah, the, the field is advancing ever faster. Um, we have access to more information, more resources, more technology, information spread quicker these days uh, in scientific publishing. People put papers up immediately as soon as they're written in preprints, for example. And I would say yeah, the, the pace in the field is quite uh, astonishing. In the field that I work in specifically, uh, there's hundreds of papers published a year that are relevant to the stuff that I'm working on. And that's just increasing every year and it's global as well. So let's dive into your story. Which Batman actor have you chosen to be your Batman? Well, you know, my favorite Batman today on screen, I think has been the Batfleck, Ben Affleck Batman. He's my, he, he's my favorite Batman on screen. Yeah. And I think that he, uh, you know, he's well prepared. Like he's been through it all. He's, uh, a seasoned veteran Batman and he'll be prepared for anything, I think. So it's an exciting day at the Gotham Gazette as Vicky Vale has an exclusive interview with the mayor to outline his key pledges for the upcoming election. As Vicky begins to ask the tough questions, the mayor begins to laugh uncontrollably initially annoyed at the flippant response. It's not until the mayor's face contorts into a grotesque, crooked smile that she realises something more sinister is afoot. A tape arrives by anonymous courier almost immediately after, with a video message from the Joker announcing the mayor was a tester for a Joker toxin released into the city's water supply. Within just a few minutes of making the call to GCPD, the Batman arrives on the scene. So with that setup, obviously there is uh, a lot of people who have potentially ingested this toxin um, and we don't know who's had it. Batman certainly doesn't know who's had it. And Batman being Batman, he's a man of preparation. He's a man who's seen all of this before. And the Joker's fatal mistake was giving that, that initial kind of canary to what was coming. It was, it was the mayor. He's able to have a look at what toxin has been ingested. So, so Batman knows um, what toxin has been used, but how does a city go about potentially checking all of their citizens? Because he has an antidote for this, Batman, but he only has a limited amount. Gotham you know, is a huge city, and they can't just deploy this from both a, a resources and time point of view to try and avoid this becoming a, a disaster. So how could Batman approach this using some of the uh, some of the research that you have? Yeah, great question. So I think that what Batman needs to do is to take an approach where he screens people uh, and screens some liquid sample from people, depending on what sort of toxin it is. So, for example, he could take a blood test, like a finger prick blood test, like uh, people use for uh, glucose monitoring and diabetes, or perhaps a urine sample. <laughs> Depends on the toxin. Could it be also 
uh, saliva or or anything or is it is it just going to be one of those depending on on how it was used what what was implemented well i imagine if it's a toxin that's really causing severe bodily harm it will be in the bloodstream or uh, circulating in the blood for the while and then being excreted uh, via urine or even feces for example if it is excreted at all so i think a blood test might be a good way of going about it so in a city of approximately 10 million people, depending on the uh, uh, on where you look, that's a lot of people to potentially test. Now, in my personal experience of blood tests in the past, these can take a long time. They can take a day, a couple of days, now up to a week. I imagine there's a lot of administrative um, waste there in, in returning results. It's not something urgent. So with technology that's available kind of now or the technology that is available potentially through your research what what kind of time i mean how could be reduced how would you approach it there's obviously way too many people to versus skilled people to administer these these blood tests so let's start off with what current blood tests are like the main method for blood tests there's a few different methods but the main method uh is a type of blood test called an enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assay, which is uh, ELISA for short. And these blood tests, uh, they're quite fiddly and they take uh, several hours to do in a research lab. So these ELISA blood tests are a lot like, well, I like to think they're a lot like making a cocktail and that they're quite slow, uh, they're not cheap, and uh, they require a lot of fiddling around uh, to get them just right. The blood tests, uh, they require a lot of different steps. Uh, for example, if you imagine a tiny miniature test tube, uh, and imagine, in fact, a plate of 100 tiny miniature test tubes, um, each one of these has to have something in it which will bind to the molecule that you're interested in, so what your toxin is. And pe uh, people typically use a, a type of molecule called antibodies. What amount of blood would you need? Is that a traditional kind of vial that I'm imagining? I'm imagining a vial and something that spins it around. Uh, is, that, is that the type of setup for this? So for conventional blood tests, yeah, people will usually get a vial of blood taken, maybe a few hundred milliliters or less. Uh, the blood test can be very efficient with the, the blood used. And typically, the blood might have to be separated into red blood cells and blood plasma. And uh, you might have to do that uh, by using a centrifuge, so sp a machine that spins the blood sample around really fast. And you might have seen on the news recently, uh, people have been developing really cheap centrifuges made out of paper for blood tests. Uh, th that's a whole nother... <laughs> Whole another story. So how how much how much how many different tests could uh, say a, a reasonably well sized and stocked uh, lab turn around in say a twenty four hour period? How long would each test take start to finish? So each blood test you could probably do a hundred blood samples of this uh, and do the same test on them in about three hours if you have an extremely well equipped biochemistry lab. And if you have an experienced uh, researcher or technician who can do that, that's someone that requires a lot of skills. Hospitals actually have machines that can do this uh, faster. For example, for really essential blood tests, some hospitals could turn around the uh, samples in 30 minutes. Okay, but even with those numbers and with those skill shortages, these, these numbers don't stack up and it seems like the city of Gotham is potentially doomed. Uh, so do you have research that may be able to improve this, maybe things that don't need a lab or skilled people, reduce the time? Yeah, so at the University of Leeds, I've been working for the past year on a new type of blood test which combines some material science uh, and nanomaterial, so very, very small materials. Uh, it also combines optics and it combines biochemistry. And the idea here is to make blood tests that take one minute instead of several hours, and to also make it very simple to do the blood tests. So rather than 
making a cocktail like I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's more like uh, adding some sugar to a cup of tea. That simple is what we're going for. So is this the type of thing that could be done um, in the field? Uh, would you would you need say if if you had a, a training video could a could a group of emergency responders turn these around um, with with no much more training than that? Yeah. So w one of the aims of developing these uh, rapid blood tests is that there will never be much use if the blood tests or machines are stuck in a research lab in university somewhere. You need to make it useful and you need to make it ideally portable uh, so that you can get the blood from the patient and into the analysis machine as fast as possible. Fortunately, uh, the blood tests that we're developing can be miniaturized into one device. So you could have a device uh, that has a light source, it has a sample chamber, and it has some detection method to detect that light. And all that can be miniaturized. So this, these nanomaterials that you're talking about, um, first of all, what does nano mean? What, what defines something as nano? Yeah, a nanometer is 1,000 millionth of a meter. <laughs> it's totally tiny. Um, the blood test we're working on use tiny crystals, which are about 20 nanometers across, which would mean that you could fit roughly 5,000 of them on the width of a human hair. They're that small. Okay, so how I'm imagining this machine working is something like a kind of Alka-Seltzer in a box where you have some powder at the bottom of a beaker and you pour some blood onto it in on a small scale is that roughly within the right wheelhouse or or how, how does it how does it actually work yeah that, that's a good analogy uh but rather than the alcohol seltzer powder being dry uh just imagine maybe uh, alcohol seltzer already dissolved in some water and then you can add that small volume of water with the nanoparticles in it into the small volume of blood for your blood test. Okay, and so what happens when the blood mixes with that solution? Is that where the light and the optics come through? Do, do you shine some light onto it and it, it reacts in a different way? or? So the optics come into it in terms of the crystals, these nanoparticles that we use. They're tiny light emitting crystals and they have some advantages for use in blood tests, which I can speak about later. But essentially what we do is we bolt on some other molecules to this crystal. So the crystals, this structure is made out of a few elements of sodium, fluorine and some rare earth elements. Uh, and to the surface of that, we add molecules that can bind uh, something that you're looking for. So if you're looking for a toxin, we'll add either antibodies, which are a type of binding molecule, or a, a different type of binding molecule that we use at Leeds called athomers. But the important thing to know is these molecules, these athomers or antibodies, can grab whatever you're looking for and bring it close to the crystal. And when you find what you're looking for, when it's close to the crystal, uh, the crystal becomes dimmer. So you can think of the crystals as little light bulbs. And when they find what they're looking for, uh, the light becomes dimmer, so it's like a little dimmer switch in a light bulb, and that's what we would detect. Is the dimming because it's coated with the thing that you're looking for? Like, wh why does the dimming occur? Well, there's some interesting physics behind that, and it's interestingly, I think, very interestingly, the same physics as behind contactless card payment. So most people will be familiar with contactless uh, cards uh, for paying for your groceries and your everyday shopping. It's the same physics, but it works on a different wavelength of light. So the, the, the cards that you use in your bank cards work on radio waves, which are pretty long. They're like 20 centimeter wavelength, roughly speaking. And the light we're using works on wavelengths uh, about 500 nanometers. So you're talking, oh, you know, a hundred million times shorter, roughly, and it's uh, smaller. And just like in contactless card payment, it, uh, which only works when you put your card really close to the card reader machine, it's the same in our blood test where these crystals only experience a dimming when you've uh, found what you're looking for and brought it really close to the surface of the crystal. And and how, how do you make these crystals? And um, like you say, they also use rare earth materials. What is a rare earth material? 
rare earth elements uh, are a set of elements in the periodic table. They're, they're quite heavy elements and uh, they're used in a lot of things. For example, uh, they're used in production of smartphones. They're in demand these days. So the, the crystals uh, that we use, these nanoparticle crystals, uh, they're made by us in the lab. So I'm a physicist, but I work with biochemists and chemists as well. So one of my colleagues uh, has been making the crystals for me, which is very kind of him. But the crystals have been around since the 1970s in one form or the other. And they're made by putting a bunch of elements uh, inside a really high pressure vessel and then basically raising the pressure and temperature inside this vessel till the temperature is several hundred degrees and the pressure is also high. And then when you do that, all the various elements that are usually by themselves uh, not bonded together in any way will form into a crystal. Is that, is that effectively replicating the natural process of making things like diamonds and coal? Yes, uh, diamonds are made under high pressure, yeah. Do you know of any other applications for these crystals before they were used for your work? Yeah, so the, the, the crystals, uh, these nanoparticles, uh, they're, they're known as up-conversion nanoparticles, and they're part of a broader family called up-conversion nanophosphors. And these have huge applications in the world of science. Uh, it goes from biomedical imaging uh, through to yeah, blood tests and toxin tests through to uh, measuring extremely high temperatures. Uh, people also use them for trying to like kill bacteria and stuff as well. And to explain why they're used for all these things, I really need to say what's so unique about them. Now, normally in biology, if people want to make something emit light uh, for whatever application, be it to, for example, uh, label parts of the cell so that they can see what's normally transparent in a cell. What you have to do is you normally have to put in quite high energy light, uh, like blue light or ultraviolet, and that can be quite bad for cells and uh, the proteins and the constituents of cells that can damage them. So you have to be very careful how much light you put in, especially this high energy light. But these nanoparticles, they sort of almost have an offset process, which is really desirable, and that you can put in infrared light, which is low energy and safer to use with biological systems. And then the nanoparticles will absorb a lot of this infrared light, but give off visible light. So it goes from low energy to high energy, when most things go from high energy to low. And it has a few big advantages for biomedical applications. The first one is that there's no background signal. Usually in uh, biosciences, if you put in some high energy light, like nearly everybody does, you'll get things in cells or other proteins and constituents of cells will also give off their own light. And that will be a background that will uh, mess up any measurements that you're trying to undertake. And uh, well, you don't get any of that with our nanoparticles, which is really nice. And our nanoparticles also give off a really nice and stable light and they don't fade away. Many, uh, many dyes and uh, proteins used in biology have the, the problem that uh, they will fade after a certain amount of time or that they don't uh, emit light in a stable manner that's really reliable. So these nanoparticles are reliable and they don't give you a background signal. And you can use this uh, really nice, not damaging infrared light. So these blood tests sound um, remarkable. Um, are these something that you're actively being looked to use in kind of a production environment? Are there any disadvantages over existing blood tests that might um, halt their adoption? So this nanoparticle based blood test is very much still a work in progress. Um, and in biosciences, things take a long time before they get from the lab into uh, use, everyday usage. So these blood tests could be really advantageous compared to current blood tests because current blood tests aren't portable. They require either a biochemistry lab or big machines that you get at a hospital. They require many steps and a lot of time, several hours. Well, the blood test that we're developing is really rapid. You can get measurements in under a minute and uh, the constituents that we use are pretty stable so it could be portable and you could even miniaturize the detection equipment that you need to fit onto 
a bat utility belt, for example. Right, so Batman being Batman, we can assume that he's going to take your research and, and run with it to the nth degree. So to try and resolve this situation, he knowing that he knows the toxin that he's looking for, he could distribute, say, to the, the, the local stadium, a whole bunch of these miniaturized blood test devices, get people through... Um, extremely quickly process people extremely quickly and safely house the people who have been infected and then bring his limited stock of antidote down and save the day is that a reasonable extrapolation there yeah i think that's a pretty good uh, vision thank you very much for your time if you'd like to discuss your research on a future episode email us at info at figshare.com <laughs>